Good evening. I'd like to call the March 7th, 2017 Longmont City Council meeting to order. This is a regular session. Could we please start with a roll call? Yes, Mayor Coombs. Here. Council members Bagley. Here. Christensen. Here. Finley. Here. Moore. Here. Peck. Here. Santos. Here. Mayor Coombs, we have a quorum. All right, let's stand for Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Anyone wishing to speak at first call, public invited to be heard, will need to add his or her name to the list outside the chambers. Only those on the list will be invited to speak at first call, public invited to be heard. Speakers who do not place their name on the list will have an opportunity to speak at final call, public invited to be heard, or on any of the um, public hearing items tonight. So uh, we've got the February 21st um, council minutes to approve. Council member Finley. 
Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I move that we approve the February 21st Second. minutes. All right, that's been moved and seconded. Let's vote. That passes seven to zero. Valerie, are there any agenda revisions? No, Mayor, we don't have any. Is there a report from the city manager? Uh, no report, Mayor Council. I did want to say that there is a the presentation and special presentations may be kind of long, so if, if Council wants, you, you can uh, move public invited to be heard ahead of that. Okay. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's maybe actually, let's do public invited to be heard first then and instead, if that's all right with everybody. Mayor Coombs. Yes, Councilmember Rick. Could I add something before the number four here? I forgot to ask you. Oh, okay. With the under the agenda revisions. Yeah. Yes. Thank okay. you. Um, thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, as I mentioned during the retreat, uh, the uh, Boulder County Open Space uh, and Fairgrounds is doing a survey as to what to do with the fairgrounds, uh, and part of that survey is going to be. Um, National Equestrian Center, and I was wondering if there, if the council would l be interested in writing a letter uh, saying that we are very interested in that survey and would want to know the results as to what the National Equestrian Survey results were. Are they'll be doing that sometime this year? Um, okay. Would, is there any we, we're not paying anything for the survey, but we can. no, okay. no, Boulder County is doing it. Okay. No, we're not paying anything. All right. So do sure. we, are, are you interested in writing a letter of support so that we uh, see that, those results? Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I just thought it would be, I'm just asking, do you think it would be worthwhile to do that, to show our support? Are you interested? Um, for, the, for, the, for the center? Or for yeah. getting the survey back? To get, uh, to support the fact that they're putting that on the survey and that we would be interested in those results. I'm not interested. Okay. Anyone else? Sure. Okay, just asking. Okay. Yeah. Why, why wouldn't we want to? Council, Council Member Santos? Thank you, Mayor Coombs. It'd probably be appropriate for us to see the letter before it was sent and then. Oh, yes. Okay, absolutely. All right. Uh, so now we're going to move on to public invited to be heard, and the first person is uh, Bruce Partain. Uh, my name is Bruce Partain. I'm 330. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. Uh, my name is Bruce Partain. Um, I'm the CEO of the Longmont Area Chamber of Commerce. I live at 330 Olympia Avenue here in Longmont. And thank you, Mayor and Council, for allowing me to uh, make some brief comments on a resolution that I think has been passed out to you already. Um, so the Longmont Area Chamber of Commerce is an independent association of approximately 700 local businesses, and organizations, and individuals. Um, I'm here tonight really to just uh, talk to you about briefly about the uh, uh, construction defect situation. The Longmont Area Chamber um, is urging the City Council to support legislative reform concerning construction defect laws. Uh, the Board of the Chamber believes that the health, safety, and welfare of the Longmont residents are being negatively impacted by the lack of affordable housing options. One reason for the housing crunch is the lack of condominiums available for sale in Longmont. That can be partly attributed to the threat of litigation that puts builders and developers at risk of substantial judgment for alleged construction defects. Uh, the Longmont Chamber Board believes that mitigating this risk at the local level might be preferable to handling it at the state level. Uh, we have given you a resolution that encourages the City Council to review the situation and to enact an ordinance similar to ordinances in other communities. Some of those include Lone Tree, Parker, Littleton, and Aurora. Um, these uh, ordinances protect consumers, but also allow property owners, developers, construction professionals, lenders, and insurers to resolve 
any construction dispute without costly litigation. We also encourage you, however, to support any statewide legislation this year that protects not only the owners of poorly constructed projects, but the builders and developers, lenders, and insurers of those projects. We suggest some provisions in the local or state legislation that would include a builder is given the right to repair any construction defect prior to the filing of a lawsuit. A homeowners association, an HOA, must obtain the consent of the majority of the homeowners in order to file the lawsuit. The builder is given the option of offering a monetary settlement in lieu of the pursuing the repairs, and mediation is required prior to the filing of the lawsuit. And that's all I have. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Paul Gibb. Hello, I'm Paul Gibb, and I'm a former Burlington Northern employee and extremely knowledgeable about commuter rail in general and about the Longmont Boulder Denver line in particular. I know every detail of it, unfortunately. Um, I've done elaborate studies and discovered, among other things, the trains from Longmont to Denver will, one, be 10 to 15 minutes faster than RTD's mobility study indicated. Two, likely have 50 to 100 percent more passengers than RTD's study indicated. That's based on uh, similar um, metropolitan areas with similar populations and the uh, number of commuters they have and likely cost a fraction of RTT's estimates, especially if we start small, with uh, a rush hour service only, maybe initially. Um, if you want details, please see me. Um, I'm much more optimistic than I was five years ago because, one, BNSF Railway is no longer flooded with oil and coal traffic, as it was back in 2012 or 2013 was the height of the oil boom and is looking for new, ven uh, new ventures. And two, RTD has finished the billion dollar airport line. But money is still a very big issue, and so is RTD's reluctance. Nevertheless, RTD is still collecting taxes from us and fares and has, uh, has a revenue in addition to the money it is getting by refinancing the, the, the loan. Um, surely RTD can borrow money against those future earnings. Um, it just needs pressure from us. Thank you. Thank you. Philip uh, Heratsaris, I probably butchered your name, but you can correct me. <laughs> you did just fine, Mayor Coombs. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak and counsel. Uh, my name is Philip Paratsaras. I am a resident of Longmont uh, 2408 Mallard Circle. <clears throat> Made my home in Longmont since 2000. And I've been fortunate to work for area employers, uh, worked for Xilinx for 16 years, and more recently I'm working uh, with a number of area startups. So it's fantastic to see on um, the website that the goal is for Longmont to be uh, the best place to live, work, and play. So I've covered living and working, so let's talk about play. Uh, Longmont has a gem, an absolute gem, in the ice pavilion. Uh, because I have the opportunity to work in town, I have the opportunity to go out there at lunch time and have a skate. Uh, my son is here with me today. All three of my boys have learned to skate at the Longmont Ice Pavilion. Um, it is a place for fellowship and com camaraderie among the hockey players, women and men. I uh, was out there Thursday night. There's 14 people out there. Uh, we're seeing a little less ice time as hockey players because the other skating programs are so popular. And, and that's fine, that's super. So uh, there is nothing like being out there uh, on a crisp night with the stars out, even if there's a little bit of snow falling, wind in your face and um, just an absolute gem for the city. So I uh, just came tonight to um, voice my hope that uh, the issue with the concrete slab maybe can be resolved in a way that we can have that pavilion open for the community again uh, come wintertime. Thank you. Brian uh, Pickerel.
Yeah, hello. Uh, Brian Pickerel, 1160 Princeton Drive. Uh, just wanted to speak to you for a moment. I'm the general manager of Fly Elite Aviation at the airport. Um, had a very good and interesting phone conversation today with the Smucker's Flight Department. Um, they're asking about our facilities and what we offer to them and what's available. I hope I presented very well to them. Um, there's a few things that I can't do for them, and I'm going to ask you as soon as you can to help me with uh, what it always comes down to is the runway length. Uh, that's what I keep hearing, and honestly, they're not the only conversation I've had about that. I, I do get a lot of corporate travel that come in, and the runway length is an issue for them. Um, and I'd just like to ask that and that's the main one. They always want bigger hangers, which I understand, and uh, de-icing capability are the other ones that come up. But the uh, the runway length is the big one, and I know we're approved to get it, but I just ask you if it comes up and you have a way to expedite that, we'd sure appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Julie Pernick. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Uh, Julia Pernak, 864 4th Avenue. Over a decade ago, I was one of the signatories on the Metro Mayor's passage of the unanimous resolution to support Fast Tracks. That was the first time in history, by the way, that all the Metro Mayors actually agreed on a taxing initiative. Since then, what have we seen? Lots of excuses, lots of nothing for our part of the world. In the meantime, I ride the bus every day. I see the Cadillac projects that are going in. One example of that is the new Civic Center Station project, which RTD cause, uh, talks as if it's a revitalization or restoration. They have completely raised an entire city block. I work right on that. The only thing that's not raised is the building I work in. They've taken out all the trees. All the, not one blade of grass is left. That's this re restoration project. They're spending money where they don't need to spend money. And I could give you innumerable examples of that. In the meantime, we've seen our service decline. Our bus station has been shuttered for years. Fares are going up. We have been paying for Fast Tracks since 2004. We've been paying for T-Rex since 1999. How long do we continue paying and all we get is excuses. The last one excuse was the economy tanked. Well, it's recovered, folks. As the earlier speaker said, Burlington Northern was the next reason the price skyrocketed. That problem no longer exists. Let me ask you to do and don't do a few things. You started tonight, hopefully, with passing this resolution to urge fast tracks forward. Don't let RTD rewrite history. That project, as it appeared on the map with the schedule, which meant it completed this year for Longmont, has already been fully vetted. It was assessed. It was estimated. It was everything back then. Don't let them change that. Don't sell Longmont short. We are not second-class citizens. Don't believe that bus is the same as train. I commute every day. Take my word for it. Bus is not the same as train. This notion about partial service is not going to work. It'll give RTD a way to prove that there's not enough ridership because the service will be so poor. Please talk to our legislators and ask for a legislative audit of RTD's books. Find out where they're spending money. And please think about asking a prominent attorney who I've spoken to that will, for a nominal amount of money, research whether or not the electorate can sue a taxing governmental agency if they fail to be accountable and fail to do what they promised the voters. Don't allow this to go on. We have been paying and paying and paying for a big zero. Thank you. Strider Benston. I do. Um, Strider Benston, 951 uh, 17th. It's good to see all of y'all here. Uh, I think it's been a long time. Um, I um, 
I've missed a lot myself. Um, it's so cool to see uh, Paul Gibb here. I've known him for 30 years. First time I've ever seen him speak at Longmont Council. I have worked for him a couple of times on different jobs. And Mayor Pernak, uh, uh, I totally agree with everything she said. And I got my National Voting Rights Museum t-shirt they gave me a couple of years ago. Um, as you may know, 52 years ago today is the day we marched across Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama to try to win the right to vote, which I thought we had secured until Citizens United and the Shelby case and stuff is eliminating the right to vote in this country. And we see the results of it. We have a new president who the kindest word I can say is a buffoon. And um, uh, the destruction of science, the destruction of the environment, the destruction of the entire concept of truth uh, is absolutely tragic for our entire society. There's going to be a march of scientists in Washington and I think in Denver this weekend just trying to recreate and uphold the banner of truth, uh, which is being exterminated from our society now. And um, every Saturday at 1 o'clock on 6th in Main, citizens of Longmont are at the very same thing, upholding the banner of truth. And a lot of people come up to us and they, all right, what are you here for? Well, we're here for education, we're here for the environment, we're here for the right to vote, we're here for decency, we're here for communication, all the way down the line. This is serious. If we're going to save our country and civilization, we have to stand up to this dictatorship, which is right now consolidating power. They cannot be normalized. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Brown? Hello, my name is Scott Brown. I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. Um, I live at uh, on Niwot Road, uh, so I'm actually not within the city limits. Um, and I wanted to speak on uh, the fast tracks. Uh, I spent 40-some years in Telluride and moved over here five years ago. And as the chairman of uh, uh, the commission that uh, worked out uh, uh, the zoning and all their other things in Telluride, um, I also <coughs> started the, um, uh, the Telluride gondola, which was an interesting thing. Ultimately, in the last few years, we turned it over to the RTD, so I have personal experience with them. And the, the Telluride gondola has now been named the best RTD transportation system in America. We carry six million passengers a year run year-round for free, and power it 100% with solar. Um, I've been going to these meetings over here for a period of time um, with RTD, and um, it seems like they're just dragging their feet, and I don't think they're actually telling you the whole truth. Uh, my information, I do business with Burlington Northern, in fact, uh, they um, and have been for many years, and they continue to tell me that uh, the story that they're telling you that the line is just too expensive to run and all is, uh, and that's the fault of Burlington Northern for how much they want to use their tracks. What Burlington Northern has told me repeatedly is no one from RTD up here in Colorado has ever asked them for a price, let alone it's too expensive. Uh, I'd also, um, I, I'm, I also, we, uh, uh, I'm the developer of the Superior Project, and we worked uh, there uh, and got 36 instead of the train, which has been a, a really disappointment to me. 
but we spent an extra two and a half million dollars on just the bike path in that crazy intersection that <laughs> you can't figure out which way to go. Um, and we certainly would uh, uh, like to see RTD perform on its uh, promises. Um, I also want to say that uh, uh, I don't know what you're thinking about uh, in, in terms of uh, annexing more property, but you'd find a very willing person to, uh, on our property over in Niwot for you to consider annexing uh, in that direction if you and I'd be happy to work with you on that. I've done a bunch of incorporations in my career. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And that ends uh, first call public invited to be heard. So now we'll go to the special reports. Good evening, Mayor Coombs and members of council. Um, I'm Barbara McGrain with Public Works and Natural Resources, and I'm here tonight to give you an update on our structural evaluation of the Civic Center slab. And uh, tonight, <coughs> excuse me, I have with me um, Jeff Cedar and Larry Alexander. They are uh, on our in our facilities group and have gotten us to this point in the uh, study as well as our uh, structural engineer, Gene Stevens, with J.R. Harris and Company. And I'm going to do a, a brief overview and introduction, and then Gene's going to come on up and go through all the data that he has to present to you. And then we'll come back together and talk about um, where we are with money and what next steps we need to take. So. You all may recall that we uh, started um, and completed in August of 2014 an in-depth uh, review of the Civic Center complex. That, that review looked at the architectural materials, the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems, as well as the structure of the Civic Center complex. And during that evaluation, our, our, when our architects were here in the building, they, they heard a what, what was likely uh, either the breaking of a tendon or the release of a tendon in the slab brought it to our attention and um, we started doing further investigation. Um, since then, um, we um, hired J.R. Harrison Company. They did a stage one structural evaluation in October of uh, 2015. And that analysis, um, when we did that analysis, we still had the insulation on the underground parking and so we really didn't have a very good look at the slab because it was coated with the insulation. So we, we did some visual inspection. Um, we determined what the, the as-built plan showed for the construction of the Civic Center. We did an evaluation on the removal of the parapet wall. And we also exposed in one or two locations the anchoring system for these tendons. And um, basically at the end of that report, um, the engineer came back and said, we need to do more structural testing, which is what we did last fall. And um, now he's getting ready to present his final report to you, which we should be receiving in the next few weeks from him. And so that's what we're going to be going through with you tonight. So Gene Stevens has got um, 40 years of structural engineering experience. He's registered in the state of California as well as the state of Colorado. And his specialty is the evaluation, and repair, and rehab of de distressed concrete structures, so we have the right person for the job. Um, he was the um, American Concrete Institute's committee chair that actually wrote the building code on how to fix distressed buildings. So um, when the building inspection calls and asks questions, they're basically talking to the chair and the people that were on that committee. And with that, I'm going to let Gene come up and go through his report and at the end give him a chance to stop and you can ask questions and then I'll come back up and we can talk about where we are with, with funding. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Gene Stevens and uh, I work for J.R. Harrison Company. I'll try not to bore you with a lot of engineering stuff, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll, under, you'll get a little bit of it. Um, 
We did a structural assessment along one Civ Civic Center podium slab. That slab is shown a partial picture there, uh, and it spans basically in the north-south direction. Slab has beams that span east-west and north-south. We're going to concentrate on the east-west beams. The uh, structure is, is shown here from the underside in the parking garage, slab, beams, and column. The purpose of the structural assessment is understand the current structural condition of the slab, determine if repairs are required to extend its life. Keep going with our little picture here. Some key elements about the slab. Basically, the slab's primary reinforcement is unbonded post-tension steel. And unbonded is, is a key part of this. Unbonded means that the steel itself is not adhered to the concrete continuously along its length. It's only anchored or restrained at the ends or the edges of the slab. The east-west beams have the same type of reinforcement, but they also have some bar reinforcement that is anchored within the concrete. The other key points about the slab are that columns for the building above don't necessarily align with the columns in the parking structure below. So the beams are transferring the load from those columns, which support the roof of the building, down to the beams and across to the columns down below. Very interesting point. So the slab is supporting the structures above, the financial building and the administration building. The slab deck is exposed on three sides, south, east, and west. Slab is also supports the external parapet that goes around the building. That's a masonry par parapet and it's quite heavy, and some of the uh, planters that are concrete. Investigation collected data on the design, concrete materials, reinforcement. Concrete cores were taken to test the concrete. Intrusive inspection wells were chipped out of the slab and out of the beams. Keeping our little picture here of, of the system with the post tension beams and post tension slab. So we chipped out the concrete underneath the beams. And in those wells that we chipped out, Put a screwdriver in there, tried to force it in between the wires of, of the tendons in order to pry them apart to see if they were loose. Very simple test. And if we could get the screwdriver in, we could pry them apart. It's as simple as that. We also chipped out along the top of the slab. And this is one of the wells. And you can see here on the right side is a group of wires, and those wires, there's nine wires there in that bundle, and they're fractured and separated from tendons that were on the left side, and they're not visible in this photo. We also inspected the underside of the beams. Same type of test put a screwdriver in uh, among the tendons or among the wires in the tendon and, and pry them apart. Very simple test. And this is what we found. We viewed roughly 256 wires. There's about 1,500 wires in the south section of the slab. It's the section we're investigating. We tested or could get to wires that we could test 78 wires, 56 of those wires were found to be loose. So we viewed about 17% of the wires in the south section of the slab. 10% is considered a good sampling. We found 70% of those wires to be loose. 
Slightly more than 21% of the wires viewed are loose. A break in an unbonded post-tension wire at any location along its length means essentially that the wire strength has been lost for the full length of the slab or the beam. So we evaluated the post-tension uh, system without the post-tension. It's unreliable. And what we investigated was first to see if the slab was, had unsafe conditions. Can't be entered if it's unsafe. Slab does not have any unsafe conditions. Keeping with our little model here, cut a section, I'll show you what I'm talking about, and this is where we get into the engineering. Put the uh, column on top of the beam, draw a little picture, and the dash lines are the section's mechanism. It's nonlinear or whether it will collapse. The anticipated load applied to the member is the load on top. Ultimate resistance of the member is then looked at. If the anticipated load exceeds the ultimate resistance, then the evaluated member is structurally unsafe. Anticipated loads are the code service loads, construction weight, people, snow loads, capacity to resist loads by engineering principles. Evaluation, second step. Discounting the post-tension reinforcement, since it's unreliable, determine if the structural repairs are necessary. How do we do this? Well, we'll take our section again, only this time we'll do a linear elastic load, which I know that doesn't make any sense to most of you. But uh, anyway, put a factored load on in the middle of it. Uh, that's what we'll call demand, or D. And we'll look at the ultimate resistance or capacity of the member. D then is the factored load combination from the code with a proven reliability or acceptable safety. Code and engineering principles can define the capacity. In new buildings, we design for the capacity to be greater than demand. You can rewrite that as capacity divided by demand is less than one. The existing structure building code permits a leeway of 10% on this. Therefore, if the demand to capacity ratio is greater than 1.1, the member has substandard strength, and by code, the repair is necessary. Structural members are required for substandard members, which includes the slab and the post-tension beams. Substandard member strength means the current strength does not provide an adequate factor of safety to resist the anticipated loads. Structural repairs are required. External post-tension reinforcement are, is anticipated. Carbon fiber is added to the underside of the slab. And bar reinforcement for, in some of the uh, added concrete members. Take a look at an example of this in the past project. This is external post-tension reinforcement that is shown in red. Close-up of the support at the column. What carbon fiber looks like, it's applied with an epoxy. This is the underside of a condominium in Malibu, California. Final comments. I'll go through these, but that's the end of my explanation for engineering. So if there's any questions, please, you know, have at. If unsafe structural conditions were determined, we need to add temporary shoring and repair the member or system. The other option is to stop using the building. That's when the demand capacity is greater than 1.5. No unsafe conditions were determined. We did determine substandard member strength demand capacity between 1.1 and 1.5. We can continue to use the building with control of the loads, not overloading it, 
and repair it. Primary issue here. Since the demand capacity is at the higher end, delaying repairs is unacceptable structurally. Design repairs starting this month and begin repairs this year. Goal of the repairs is 50 year life expectancy with only routine maintenance. Final picture, final slide. Broken tendons at a different location than what I showed you before. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. How did you, how do you, det I mean, without going into, in layman's terms, please, <laughs> uh, how do you determine capacity and demand? M meaning um, how, those, those numbers. Well, okay, if, if I'm checking for uh, unsafe conditions, the demand is determined from basically the code using service load or the realistic loads. The ultimate capacity is determined by a collapse mechanism, which is beyond, it's nonlinear, it's beyond most engineering, structural engineers' capacity to even do that. But basically what we're looking at is what load does it take to form the hinges that I showed you in, in the circles and a mechanism for a point load or the exact uniform loads that the structure sees. And how'd you, how'd you determine that? I mean, what'd you do? I mean, I understand. Eng okay. Engineering principles is, is basically a mathematical calculation. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you All didn't right. do tests, you just did math, right? We, we, okay. we did testing to determine what the material strengths and the properties we could use. That's, that's, that's first strength and safety. Then there is another step, and this deals with factored load cases, which are the co lo codes, factored load cases, and we use linear analysis resistance, and we did it three-dimensionally with a finite element program to determine what the capacity was to calculate moments and bending strengths, shear strengths, and, and the actual demand on the structure. Thank you. Okay, that's the best I can do, sorry. Lots of big math, got it, yeah. I got it. <laughs> Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Just to clarify, um, you took concrete cores and determined its, its um, compression strengths? Yes. And then you took, did you take any samples of the steel and do tensile testing? We, we took samples of the post-tension steel. We did not take samples of the bar steel and we did use the bar seal, but the, what's on the drawings, and we have the original drawings that were done by Johnson, Boylan, and Archuleta out of Boulder, and we use that in our analysis. So, so we haven't done steel tests, but we have done concrete tests. Okay, so <clears throat> is there any way to do any deflection measurement of loaded areas? Say that again. <clears throat> can you actually measure any deflection in the structural members? I can show you where the structural members are cracked. We have not done a survey to determine what the deflection is, and and to do a load test would cost more than your repairs. Okay, let's not do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to minimize costs here and not maximize them. I don't want to spend money on engineering when we can fix it and, and do a better job. Right. <clears throat> did you, I guess another question would be, did you do any measurements of any um, current levels of deflection or sagging? No. Okay. No, we haven't done that. So are you good at math? <laughs> I, I, am I going to? We're going to Is serve. You, are you good at math? Am I good at math? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very good at math, actually. <laughs> I can still do calculus from uh, undergrad engineering school. So, Councilmember Christensen. Well, as you were giving your uh, presentation, I began to think, are we going to have to evacuate? <laughs> Did we get out of here right now? No. Um, <laughs> so I'm very glad that you did this. I, I, we all know that this has been going on for a while, and we appreciate you taking a look at this. So um, is it your understanding that, and actually this is better than I thought it was going to be, 
is it your proposal to do most of these corrections and mitigation from in the basement? Yes. Okay. Yes. It, because everything up above ground here is <sighs> no, uh, above in in the buildings and on the roofs. We're nothing. No problem. Okay. okay. Outside the buildings, uh, yes. I, I want to slope the uh, put on an additional topping and slope it away from the existing structures, make it drain better and add strength. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, that's a great relief. Thank you. <laughs> so, just curious, with what we know about engineering now and building design, would a building built today use these types of uh, tensioning and materials, and or would have we evolved to something that would actually last 50 to 100 years of that? I, well, uh, that's an excellent question. Um, let me tell you that the system that's actually used in, in, in the podium slab is no longer used. Mm -hmm. That uh, wire system that is actually wrapped with paper uh, has been replaced with a much smaller wires much larger number that is called a wire strand. It's coated with plastic. It's yeah. much more protective. Uh, the other important part about this is in the current system, when a strand breaks, it, it pops and the concrete is, is generally broken in mm -hmm. the, the area of the strand fracture. The current system, there is a slight bit of bonding and when it breaks, you may or may not hear it. It is very difficult to determine where the breaks are. Uh, history on other projects similar to this shows that it's, it's elusive, it's hard to detect, it's, it's a problem. So it's not used anymore, <laughs> okay? okay? Thank you. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. As Council Member Christensen said, it's not as bad as as we thought, um, to a point. So thank you for the analysis and, 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 and the study, Harold, when, or Barb. <laughs> so we have a few more slides to go There's over. more slides, because uh, if, if this needs to be done ASASAP, let's go. Barb's going to go I, over that. All right. I'll thank you. No, I thank don't. You. Thank you. That's math beyond my measure. <laughs> So just to remind you all, um, the Civic Center was completed in 1975. It, it is close to, you know, it's over 42 years old. So it's... Most of us are over 42. So it wasn't built five years ago. So, um, so what we had in the 2016 budget was to do this phase two structural um, evaluation and start some minor repairs. That was based on that original study that was done in October of four, or August of 14, that that first report, and because we didn't have any data to tell us that we needed to do any repairs, so we didn't assume any repairs because we didn't even know what the number would be. And then the 2017 budget that got approved for this year was another 1.6 million dollars, and that was to continue on with those things that had been identified in that same study which included starting to do some protective coating on that slab on the outside, re uh, replace the garage perimeter screen, um, rehabilitate um, the brick and concrete on the outside, uh, replace the storefront glass and the skylight rehab. And obviously now the repair of the slab is the highest priority, so we're not gonna do any of that. <laughs> we're gonna do this first. Right now, uh, the engineer is estimating these repairs at $4 million, of which we had approximately $200,000 in this existing budget. So we need to find some additional money. Um, that The CIP that we showed in the, in the 2017 through 2021 CIP did not include any repairs for this slab. Um, the work, um, once we get uh, our funds secured, will likely take 18 months to two years. That includes design, uh, bidding, and construction. Um, we will move along as quickly as we can. We are also uh, talking to folks about loads in the building and, and um, not having, um, moving things around and not having large crowds of people and things anymore. So we are starting to uh, look at all of that. 
What's left from last year's budget is a uh, little under $800,000. I still need to pay him for his first report. Um, I want to use all that money as well as the money uh, that we had this year, which is around $2.4 million that I can immediately um, put towards this and um, want your approval to go ahead and rescope all that um, and make sure that we're going to use it on the slab repair. And then next steps are um, we have already started looking at reprioritization of uh, other CIP projects and the Public Improvement Fund. And um, uh, we'll be coming back soon with those reprioritizations and uh, wanting to move forward with, with this work as soon as we can. So short answer is we have a solution for the remaining uh, 1.6 million. Um, we are going through the Public Improvement Fund right now looking at projects. So if there's a question of can you come up with the 4 million, the answer we're gonna give you is yes. Um, we will have to defer, delay, some of the other projects that are in the public improvement fund. For example, um, one of the things that we've talked about is flooring. So flooring will be something as we have that projected. Other than areas where there's safety issues related to the flooring, uh, most of the flooring will be put off um, so that we can, we can do this work. I also wanted to say when he talked about the repairs, um, they're gonna put ten the, the external tendons in that you saw but it also means that we're gonna take the parapet wall down and we'll have to go back with some type of metal structure that doesn't carry the same weight. So the brick wall around the facility will go away. Um, that's actually meeting two goals because when we look at our SEPTED, our safety analysis of the facility, that was one of the things that was recommended there. So um, we'll get that benefit. The other thing that's gonna happen is the planners that are on the slab. So there's a planner by the city manager conference room there's a planner on the entryway, those will have to go. Perhaps the biggest planner that'll have to go is the big circle planner in front of the library. Um, that weight has to be taken off the slab. So those will be some of the projects that'll occur in addition to um, the, the tendons that they're putting in place. Again, what we're finding is a lot of the SEPTED work that we did by law enforcement looking at safety issues around the building, most of those items are actually on that list too. So we'll be accomplishing a couple of things with this project. But I do want you to know that there is money within the Public Improvement Fund. We, are, we will be bringing back a recommendation as soon as possible with the projects that we are talking about um, delaying or unfunding at this point. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. And, and I, I appreciate that reprioritization of those projects, however, my concern is that some of those projects have to be done, need to be done as well. I, I know that Civic Center is number one top priority. Um, I would hope that it, one night the gym's not here, um, that perhaps use of fleet as you know, it has been uh, the fleet fund, uh, a loan to, uh, from fleet to this or those other projects, or potentially we had talked months ago regarding a, uh, a bond uh, for several projects that uh, other uh, f facilities that need to, to roll this in or those other projects that may become unfunded. I think it's, again, the, 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 just the, re just the O&M of our facilities are, are very important. So uh, while I understand the Civic Center is priority number one, I don't want to see those others pushed off too far. Yeah, no, we're actually looking at, you know, the analogies have to, need to, want to in terms of the public improvement funding. This is not really in the bond scope because a lot of these pro projects are not projects that you would bond for right. because the life expectancy doesn't match the term of the bond. So if you're going to issue 20 year debt, the life expectancy of whatever you're doing should at least match that term. Right. And, and so we're, we are evaluating those options. Um, the fleet fund, you still have to have the re repayment mechanism for that. Um, well, we and think what that, I'm suggesting is p potentially that if we have to borrow from fleet or something else, right. if we go for a bond, because this is going to make, make uh, this, is, this will be for that 20 year requirement, I would think it's going to last another 50 years that perhaps a payback could be done at that time. And that, and that is something that you can include in that. What I will say is, you know, we will not um, eliminate or defer a project that needs to be done. Thank That's you. part of what we're looking at in the process. Um, I think what this does underscore when we talk about the condition of our facilities, 
um, there is a need to put those dollars back in to maintain your facilities mm -hmm. so you don't end up in a situation like this. We sort of had a similar conversation when we talked about parks and the need to reinvest in our infrastructure. This is the same conversation. Um, I think fortunately when we look at some of our other projects um, like safety and justice in the library, we did find out, and I don't know if I can say this, the foundation for the the foundation for the library is actually in really good shape. Is that what I heard? Uh, so, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a difference. It's, so we're finding, but, but what you want to do is actually go in and maintain those right. so that you don't end up in the same position. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I was going to ask about the library. So how far does that, sl the slab goes up to the? It goes basically up to the library. Oh. It's basically up to the library. It, yeah. it, uh, it's a different slab. There's an expansion joint. Oh. When you first drive into the uh, underground parking, mm -hmm. and that expansion joint right. to the south is, is the primary area of, of concern. Right. To the north, which is the part where the hung ceiling is and it goes out underneath the, the library, right. it's doing much better, but it had almost twice as much post-tension reinforcement so it doesn't have the cracks in it that the other uh, system has, and those cracks are what allowed the water in to cause the corrosion of the post tension and cause our problems. Yeah, and it also didn't have the load. It did not have but the load, right? It still, we still have to get rid of that fountain. And it, preferable, uh, it's it's advisable because it. Yeah could eventually cause a lot of problems. And it, because it's covered up with the ceiling, it's very difficult to see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. And so when they talked about the water, so if, you, if you've ever been in my office after it rained, you saw water coming underneath the wall. Oh. That slope is actually part of the issue that they have to correct to get it to drain the other direction. And that's part of the $4 million. That's all part yeah. of this number. Yeah. In comparison then to $4 million to renovate and just to mitigate this uh, building, how much would it cost to tear it down and replace it? I haven't done an estimate on it, but It'd be a I lot would more guess though. 12 to $15 million. Okay. I just wanted to... Yeah. Enlighten the audience about it. It's yeah. a structural cost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's, laughs> it, it would be much more. I yeah. think it's I know. more. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I guess uh, one, how how expensive would it be to double check his math? First question. I, I mean, I'm not doubting you. I'm just a, a natural skeptic. So the just cost of the repairs. No, no, just just how much you know the the, the your your math to determine the problem. One hundred thousand dollars or or more. Okay. Uh, it costs one hundred thousand dollars for me to do it originally. It would cost that much or more if you could find somebody that knew how to do it. Okay. Yeah. That and would then, be the biggest problem. Then, it would take me. Uh, I know of one engineer that I trained, other than my boss, that could possibly do that in the state of Colorado. Okay. So that. Um, again, not uh, again. The I have no doubt that you're smart and you're good at what you do, and uh, but the uh, what happens if we don't do anything? We can't. My, uh, I just I want to know what I mean. what what happens if you don't do anything? You violated the code, and I'll let the building department tell you that you can move out of your structure. Got it. Okay, that's really that's what I was it. Asking. And then. Um, Good enough. Thanks. So one final question. What if we get like a three and a half foot snowfall before we get this thing fixed? Would that be a problem? Sorry. You. <laughs> Let me give that one to me again. What if we get a three and a half foot spring snowstorm? Um, Clear the snow by hand. Don't okay. put a tractor up there and plow it off. Okay. I'm serious. Okay. It's as simple as that. It, I have told uh, the, the people here that you've got to keep that cleared off. You okay. can't accept a, a snow load of that size. Okay. 
Thank All you. right. So some things that have changed. So council knows they used to have the book sale for the library. We have now said that the book sale can, the book sale cannot or occur in the civic center. Um, you know, the example what he said is one time they used to bring equipment with a brush on. Kubota. And, and the Kubota, and as they went by my office, and as it was doing it, you could feel it. Yeah. We're not using that and, anymore and so this none winter. none of that is allowed on there. So it's a, so we're, we're watching the loads. Um, so if, if we get a big snowstorm on a weekend, you'll call people in with snow shovels and we'll... Okay. We're going we're so, to have to be doing the work to get it cleared. Okay. So I, I want to go back to one, one point that uh, Council Member Bagley brought up. So this guy is the chair of the committee that wrote the code that everybody follows. And the only other guy that he would hire was on that same committee and they wrote it together, and he's in a firm down in Denver, and he's the one that came up and looked at the ice rink, and they're, they, both of these firms are very, very busy. So okay. there's a lot of work right now. So, so what, we would, what I was asking Barb earlier, we would have asked him to look at the ice rink too because of, of the uh, post-tension that, that broke. He, he was too busy. The other guy that was on the committee that wrote the code is the one that we're using to look at that That's facility. Flat. All right. Thank you. Okay. I guess we're ready to move on to our consent agenda. Mayor Coombs, your first item on consent is resolution 2017-16, a resolution of the Council of the City of Longmont finding that the petition for annexation of parcels of land located in Boulder County, State of Colorado, known as the Nova Annexation. This is generally located at 9191 and 9295 Nelson Road, substantially complies with the Colorado Revised Statute, Section 3112-107. And consent agenda item 9, 8B is resolution 2017-17. A resolution of the Longmont City Council urging the Regional Transportation District to place new revenue in the Fast Track's internal savings account. And staff does not have a need to pull either of these. Councilmember Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I would move passage of the consent agenda. Sorry. All right, I'll second that. Let's vote. Just a second. And that passes seven to zero. Mayor Coombs, your um, item on second reading of public hearing is ordinance 2017-10, a bill for an ordinance amending chapter 10.50 of the Longmont Municipal Code on disposition of property. We do not have a formal staff presentation on this item, but we do have staff present to address questions. All right, if there's no questions from council, I'm gonna open up the public hearing on ordinance 2017-10, is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak on this ordinance? Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing in ordinance 2017-10. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I move ordinance 2017-10. Second. All right, that's been moved and seconded. Let's vote. And that passes seven to zero. And now we're off to general business. General business item is the hard to recycle sanitation services and Bob Allen is here to make this presentation. If Bob Allen can find his file here. Right. Um, Mayor and Council, I'm Bob Allen, uh, Director of Operations, Public Works and Natural Resources. And I'm here tonight to talk about uh, Longmont's hard to recycle services at your request or snow removal on the <laughs> pad out here. <laughs> Either works. Um, probably a good starting point here would be to just clarify what is hard to recycle. These are pretty common items, a list of common items. Electronics I put up top because they're the most commonly recycled items that the um, 
hard to recycle events here in Longmont. Large furniture items, appliances, um, non-freon types of appliances, uh, non-hazardous oils and batteries, um, any odd or large shaped item. Um, lar large volumes of commonly recycled items like paper and um, a lot of aluminum. Uh, styrofoam and plastic, these are all pretty common. Um, and coincidentally, things that we already do offer options for uh, many of them, but not all of them. So um, these are things in general we don't want in either trash carts or in recycle carts. And uh, many of them we like to divert from landfills. Electronics uh, specifically have precious metals. Um, they also have hazardous metals uh, when they dissolve. So they're better diverted if possible. So a history of what we've done uh, with our recycle services in Longmont. Um, EcoCycle has provided a hard to recycle event um, at the Waste Diversion Center on Martin Street dating back 10 years plus. Uh, most of you know that EcoCycle actually operated that facility under contract for us and that's when they started those events. That was discontinued last year. Um, they were not generating enough revenue from what they collected from the uh, customers per item that they charged. Um, we had periodic stop and drop events um, at Airport Road. Um, those, that was not a recycle event, but it did al allow for disposal of large furniture items and um, other large odd shaped items. Some of those things would make it into recycle, but most of them were landfilled. That was discontinued. Um, actually, 2012, I think, was our last stop and drop event, but um, council in 2011 um, discontinued that when we set the rates back at that time. Um, most of our sanitation or periodic sanitation events have been um, discontinued. Um, the primary reason for that is the facilities we have weren't really developed for those types of events. Um, they certainly worked for it when Longmont was smaller and we had less traffic, but um, they were a problem. Um, they have been a problem for traffic for some time. Um, we've always had handling problems with those events. So if you can imagine, um, those items show up in trucks in all sizes and cars in all sizes with stuff just stuffed in there that our employees had to extract and dispose of. And it wasn't particularly safe. We weren't really very well equipped for that. And that's really not a modern approach for doing that. So a facility like the um, Center for Hard to Recycle Items in Boulder that EcoCycle owns and operates is a more common type of facility for that. Um, we have, though, in response to that, we've added a lot of um, drop-off options at our Waste Diversion Center for hard to recycle items. So other than electronics and large furniture, um, we have some pretty good options there. We can take large metal objects, um, oils, batteries, styrofoam, plastic, um, appliances of really most sizes as long as they don't contain Freon, um, and then large, you know, bulks of paper and, and uh, aluminum cans are pretty commonly dropped off there. So um, I've divided this into a couple of um, discussions here. One is short-term options, and then uh, we'll take a look at some long-term options. Um, in the short term, uh, we could continue with what we're doing right now. Um, that is that um, residents can use the Waste Diversion Center for many of the hard to recycle items and they can take electronics either to local shops that will receive them or haul them uh, to the um, Charm Center in North Boulder. Um, this obviously would be an attractive option because it doesn't come at any cost. Um, we honestly really haven't heard any complaints about what we're doing right now. Um, I know one of you has asked us to um, look at other options, but we're not really aware of any customer complaints with how we're currently operating. Um, unless you know of something that we don't, we haven't heard much. Um, a short-term option uh, that would buy us some planning time if uh, we wanted to look at some long-term alternatives uh, would be to uh, restore the EcoCycle program. And uh, this is something we could do for probably about 5,000 per year. And we could probably do that for at least a year, uh, maybe a year and a half without any, any rate impact or any impact on the fund. Um, it doesn't, and I really want to reinforce, it doesn't solve the problems that we have. It doesn't solve the problem that's actually causing EcoCycle 
to request money to do the, the program. They need to hire traffic control out there. And um, they use um, a lot of work release or uh, uh, jail release um, work to handle items. I don't know if that's still viable for them. I really don't know what their business model is for this. I do know that they've said they could probably do another year of it at this cost. So um, that would be in the short term an option we have. Long term options, um, the first one would be to, if we wanted to try to restore event type of, of uh, collection in Longmont, and we could probably do more than just hard to recycle. Uh, but if we wanted to do that, um, if we were to do the plan developments at the Waste Diversion Center, um, which were costed out for us at about 1.1 to 1.5 million, we could probably incorporate um, some options into that design that would allow us to stage traffic um, around that facility. So that'd probably be a perimeter road that was paved on the external part of the facility. I don't know if it gets rid of all the option or all the problems that we have with traffic out on Martin Street, but it probably would help. Um, we would have to acquire equipment and, and have some staging there that we don't have uh, that would ease the handling and make it safe for customers to come into the, the facility. So right now, customers come in, hop out of cars in the line of traffic and drop things off, which is really not ideal. Um, what you need is you need an offline kind of staging area they can drive into, one that has um, all the considerations for their safety and then allows them to drop off items and us to remove them and then for them to move out of there without any hazard. Another option, um, and it's one that we would have to explore, I can't say standing here tonight that it's available to us, but it would be to create um, a drop-off option for the most uh, demanded um, hard to recycle item and that would be electronics and that's predominantly uh, right now televisions. Uh, computer mo uh, monitors and devices too but predominantly televisions. Um, this option would not include um, large item drop off. Large item drop off kind of puts us into a whole new um, business. Um, we would need more area for that and definitely more equipment than we have. Um, even in the first long-term option, that would be a lot more problematic, having a large item staging area. But we probably could do electronics. Um, we think um, for an annual cost of seventy to 100000 if we could find a willing partner to haul it away. We would have to put that back behind um, the normal drop-off areas and confine it only to residents uh, because this would be a pretty popular regional facility if we just let it occur out front and would be fairly expensive for us. So um, assuming we could find a willing partner, um, these cost estimates are a, a pretty pretty vague right now to be honest, that 70 to 100,000. Um, it's possible from some of the early research that we've done that we could hit within that price range, but we're not certain of that. Um, both options would have a rate impact uh, minimally um, 20 to 50 cent per month per customer um, could be twice that. We haven't really been able to refine costs to hit you know, more accurately um, that we would need to hit to, to bring that back and, and start talking real dollars and cents. So um, short term, long term options, um, it's really your call as to what you'd like to do with it. Councilmember Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Well, while Bob was giving us his presentation, I just happened to Google, love Google, electronic sure. recycling, Best Buy. They have a plethora of things that they recycle for free. Limit three items per household per day. Products they recycle for $25 per item are tube televisions smaller than 32 inches and flat panel TVs. LCDs, plasma LEDs, smaller than 50, 50 inches. I'm sure there are other, I, I do know of a, another electronics recycle. They take printers. Um, it's, gosh, it's over there by our LPC, a little bit more expensive. But I, I'm trying to recall how this came, how this all came about again. I, I know that some folks like the hard, the hard to recycle events that we had. And I do remember um, back in, I believe, 
early 11, um, we talked about just discontinuing because it was not cost effective for the city to continue doing this. Um, I'm not interested in a rate increase. We're already raising rates for uh, other options, whether it's pay as you throw or, you know, you if you'd like to do um, another fee for composting or what have you. Um, there are other organizations that can do this better than we can, um, much more cost effective. Councilor Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I was wondering the same thing Councilmember Santos was wondering. Uh, I always think back to for good public policy, you need to first define the problem. I've never once heard anybody complain that they didn't have a place to take their hard to recycle things. Never once has it come up at coffee with council that I've been to or any public meeting that I've been to. It looks, I, I have no idea how, um, I don't recall how this came to be on our plate, but I, uh, I would never look at increasing utility bills again for something like this that hasn't even been a problem. Uh, for anybody that I know of anyway. We have lots of, um, lots of ways to recycle. We're lucky in that way. Within 30 miles of here, you could get rid of just about anything you want to, and we don't have to I increase any rates. So uh, I do appreciate you looking into this, but I, I, I think the status quo is the best way to go. You know, I want to jump in here. Um, you know, I, I've never had any problem taking stuff down to charm some older computers and um, TVs and stuff. Um, the only reason why I'm kind of a little bit interested in it is I worry about people that are too lazy to take stuff and or they don't want to spend the money. They'd rather just dump it out on some county road. So sometimes when you have things like this, it does a public service that we don't realize because it keeps people that don't want to spend the money to properly dispose of hard to uh, or don't want to take the time, and that stuff just ends up, you know, dumped in some ditch on a county road. That was my only concern, but, you know, if that, I don't know. Do, do you ever get any feedback from the county that that's been a problem at all? Uh, Mayor Coombs, we, we typically don't see electronic items okay. disposed of roadside like we do furniture, okay. and we haven't heard that that's a problem. But you raise a really interesting point. And that's it. We also don't know that a lot of those items aren't the smaller ones being disposed of in trash carts. Right. It's possible that the best first step here is rather than adding to or adding a program or enhancing a program might be to engage more in public education information on this and in, use the funds that we have for that program to encourage more of that recycling and divert away from the trash cart. Okay. Then see what kind of demand we have as that kind of evolves. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Okay, uh, just to remind Council, I'm the one that asked for this. I wanted to have the evaluation of what, is, what the impact of the city would be and what the cost would be. Um, my concern is that I had um, what do people do with their mattresses? They just, and what do they do if they dump them in a city park? Do we have to pick them up? And, well, that's probably not a huge, big, everyday issue, but at the same time, it's, it seems like everything we do at the waste disposal center down there is really well used. Um, so I guess it's, um, if people will take their electronics and have them properly recycled, that's one thing. But it is, there is a state law that says you can't put them in a the trash cart, too. Uh, doesn't mean people won't do that. <clears throat> what I'm seeing out of this, though, is um, if there is demand, the, the education could probably be a way to get to the root cause of that and um, let people know more about their options and where they can take it. We do the free landfill days still, right? We do. And um, if you have a mattress, that's the place to take it, I suppose. Um, however, it's if it's not that big a problem, how many people have we had to use it? 
Mayor and Council, the last event, I believe we were somewhere around 225 people back in um, September 11th, I think. Okay. So that and, would be and costing us $10 a person to whoever might participate, yeah. About 5% of that was um, large items. So it's mostly re re electronics? Electronics. Unfortunately, the large items are the ones that are most problematic for us to have a facility for. Sure. So what about, uh, how, do, how do we, can we participate with EcoCycle to just do electronics only? Have we looked into that at all? Mayor, Council, um, we haven't asked that question specifically. Um, I would imagine in the long term, their costs would be the same as any contractor we would look at. So we would certainly include them in that investigation of who might provide that service and see if there's any chance we could find it at a much lower cost than what we're estimating right now. Um, that, that it's a good question and one I'd have to explore more. And um, I guess the only other question I have is, uh, is there a way to accumulate them and then do bulk drop-offs at Charm? It's possible. Um, that does add to our services in a different way. And depending on how much we received, um, whether or not that was worth the cost of doing it would be the question. But it's something that could also be explored. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Um, Bob, um, I have seen couches and chairs, uh, especially on 17th near the apartments, just out on the curb. So my question is, how many times, if any, does the city get calls to go pick up those things, um, furniture that's been left or whatever, and what is the cost of that to the city to do that? Do you know? Is that a big issue with us? Mayor and Council, um, that's, so that's hard to, for me to tell you what the cost okay. of all of that work would be to us. But I will say this, um, we spend probably a half day each Friday picking up illegally dumped trash throughout the city. Um, there isn't anything we've really done to prevent that or stop that. I imagine, and, and by the way, um, I think every city that we've mm -hmm. talked to is dealing with the same problem. I don't know that that's going to go away despite anything we do other than in the center of town have a large trash pile that we could just continually move out of there. Um, or Martin Street, um, mm -hmm. but as I said, the cost for that would be, um, the upfront capital cost for that would be quite a bit more than I think our operating costs right now to deal with it on a daily or on a Friday weekly basis. And do those items go into the landfill? They do, yes. If we, uh, on the large item recycle days, and those items were brought there, would they go into the, to the landfill then or were those recycled? We would need, it would be the same problem for us if we were to try to recycle those um, items from our facility. Right now what we can do is we can load them in the back of a packer truck that compresses that trash and then hauls it to the landfill. If we now have to come back and stage that at a facility, um, then we're developing that facility for large items. Um, certainly we could do less of that for just the city's use and not for residential use if we wanted to do that. Now, I guess my question was when EcoCycle was doing the uh, large items and, and those furniture items were brought to them, did they recycle them? Yes, they would haul them to their charm facility and recycle there. So I guess, you know, we're trying to reduce the amount of stuff in our landfill by composting. So to fill it up with furniture, I mean, doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. So my other question was, um, what are the possibilities of having Lisa Koblach, our sustainability uh, coordinator, look for some grants to uh, fund this program um, with EcoCycle um, until we can get the money to uh, our renovations 
for the $1.1 million for the renovations. Because it seems like when we offer something to somebody and then they're used to doing it and then we take it away, they, they get out of the habit of recycling. And um, I guess that's my problem, filling up the landfill on one end and trying to not fill it on the other end doesn't make any sense. Um, so have you also, what are the chances of reaching out to other uh, communities like Firestone, Frederick, Mead, and having uh, a huge event day and sharing the costs of, of hauling it away or taking it to the Sheriff Center? Have you looked at that? Uh, Mayor and Council, um, so let me go back to a couple things you raised That's because a lot of a, questions. <laughs> well, um, first of all, I want, on, it's not um, safe to make the assumption that everything dumped roadside is recyclable. Um, a lot of that is in such poor condition and very little of it, if it's not wood, is recyclable and is trash. Okay. Um, so um, we did actually do some exploration of what other communities are doing. And the most predominant approach they're taking is recommending their residents to go to the Charm Center. Um, so most of them in Boulder County are doing that. But some did try to do what we had been doing, were events with EcoCycle, mm -hmm. and some tried to handle it themselves. Um, it looked like pretty mixed reviews of whether or not they were successful in doing that. Um, the, the best way I can answer, though, your your kind of penultimate question is, we can do anything you want us to do. But I'll go back and kind of remind you of what I've said in previous presentations. We're right now built for residential cart collection. That's what our program is. We have a waste diversion center that is in need of major repair mm -hmm. and development. We don't have staffing and equipment to start handling other types of of waste programs in the city. We can do that, but it is expensive for the city to get in some of those businesses because we can't spread those costs regionally like our private partners or private competitors can do. So we can look at all those options. I just can't say here today that they're going to be mm -hmm. terribly economically viable. Um, but if you want Longmont Sanitation to solve all problem sanitation, that is different than what we're built to do right now. And I know you're not necessarily asking no, for that. I'm not. But it, it does, when you start having the discussion here, the, the knee bone and the thigh bone and the ankle bone all start getting connected and it's hard for me to answer in a vacuum for each one of those individually. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Bagley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I move that we have Bob Allen solve all problems <laughs> of sanitation. <laughs> would, that would, that would, that would, uh, no. The, uh, I guess the, uh, I think that uh, you've already, I mean, thinking, we've got uh, big items uh, you can already take up to the, to the dump. Um, you've got, uh, as Councilmember Santos and Councilmember Finley pointed out, you've got Best Buy that you can take your electronics in. You've even got people like Paul Tiger here in town who will take your electronics, and he actually makes a living off of it by scavenging off like some science fiction movie, you know, gets the precious metals out of it and collects them and sends them in. So there are ways. So I think that status quo but plus education um, I think would be the cheapest and best use. However, and I was actually going to bring this up during our uh, council comments. I, I think that what we should be doing, the lowest hanging fruit, if you want to look at uh, a landfill issues, is uh, offering recycling to our businesses. Um, right now, my office, we go through so much paper and pop cans, and you know, we always have a we're wrapping it up and taking it out to the car and taking it home. And uh, when I'm going out to the Western Disposal and looking in their trash bin, 90% of it's recyclable. And so, I mean, I think that if we're going to do something for the environment and offer something sanitation-wise that was going to have an impact on our landfill and be pro-environmental and offer a service that people are willing to pay for, I'd, I'd suggest that before we do something like this. Councilmember Christensen. Um, actually, I do agree with Councilman Bagley about that and about most everything. Um, I do think that 
education is the main, uh, f just for tonight, just for tonight, just for that issue. <laughs> um, I do think, though, that um, we do have local resources, and I do think that the education thing is really critical because people need to know the whole range of where they can recycle things, both at EcoCycle, uh, at the Charm Center, and the sorts of things they recycle, like paint. I mean, I think you're right that most people just, they feel bad, but they throw that paint can in the trash can anyway. They feel bad, but they throw their old phones away in the trash can. And, but if they, if they actually knew that they could take them to these various places locally, I, I think most people would be happy to do that. Um, so I do think that um, having a, um, you know, keeping the status quo out at the Lim Diversion Center, which the old name of it, um, <laughs> is a good idea. But I, I, because I spend a lot of time out at the Lim Diversion Center, um, <laughs> I recognize that we're going to have to, at some point, put some love into that because right now, if you go through and put things in the metal recycling and then there's a fence around that and you try to get out of there and some landscaper has just dumped a whole bunch of stuff at the limb thing and they are taken off at 30 miles an hour, you're going to get clipped just trying to turn there. It's, you know, as you know, that there, there, there are problems with this, the infrastructure there because it used to be just limbs, then it became metal, then it became cardboard, now it's... It's a lot of things. So that we're going to at some point have to make an investment. So I'm glad that Councilman Moore asked for this to be done because it gives us an idea of what we are going to need to, to think about in the future for that center. Um, I also wanted to say that you, you still, uh, the city does still offer pickup of large items for $75, right? That's helpful. Yes, and, and it's, I think, $35 per, per okay. two items. Oh, two large items. But you also have dump, rental of a dumpster, is that right? No? We do rent dumpsters as well, yes. Okay, yeah, because that's something that um, my neighbors and I, who used to be in that endless line for the dumping event, all of western uh, Old Town used to go out there and throw all their stuff. <laughs> it's kind of fun, but it, it got to be completely unwieldy for you guys and also for us. We'd wait there for three or four hours. Um, so I, you know, I see why we can't do that anymore. It's just unfeasible. Um, but I do think that publicizing the fact that you have uh, dumpsters and large item pickups is good. And then the electron, letting people know where they can go locally for electronic items is a, a good education piece there. And I, I also would like to request that maybe you consider moving the plastic bag thing over where the cardboard is. I know why you don't do that, but <laughs> it's a pain if you just have plastic bags to drop off to have to go through the line. Okay, thank you. If, if I may comment, too, um, th this, is, this issue is an evolving issue. And if you recall, when we were talking last year about composting, we had a, a kind of, um, you know, grand idea of this regional sorting facility that could, you know, deal with a lot of the waste and recycle that's out there. I think that the future is going to look more like that than what it does today. And I think that there will be other options we'll discover. So. Whatever we do here tonight, um, in a month it's going to be a little different, and two months it's going to be even that much different. And um, we're always happy to come up and have this conversation and keep moving it the way we want to or thinking about it, whether we act or make decisions on it. So, um, Council Member Moore, thank you for bringing it up, and um, you know it's it's a good topic and one that probably we should be having some time with every year. Councilor Finley. I was just going to ask you, do you know who does it for businesses when they have bring in your recycling or your electronics? I know several businesses, I think Remax did it one year, bring in your recycling. That's got to be a company that doesn't charge very much to do it. <laughs> there, are, there are private haulers that 
specialize in this type of business. So there are some out there and, um, you know, I, I don't know what the costs are. I didn't explore that, but there are a lot of options out there. Council Mayor Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coons. Well, it sounds like education is going to be the, the, the key to keeping things out of either the containers or the landfills. So I, I would hope that you guys would <clears throat> not only look at Charm, EcoCycle, but see what other, you know, Best Buy, you know, some, some sort of in city line or a letter to uh, an editorial saying, hey, you know, instead of doing this, here, here are some options and here are some ways to go about getting rid of some of your hard to recycle items. So it just sounds like education is the, the key and, uh, you know, while, you know, if we had a plethora of money, you know, there's a lot we could possibly do. Council Member Moore. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Well, <clears throat> I don't want to spend 5000 a year on this. It's simple as that. You know, we can spend some of that on education outreach. I think it's better better money spent. Um, one thing that just occurred to me, too, is that this is kind of in flux right now with they're putting out the EcoCycle um, processing center out for bid, so we don't know what's going to come back and what it's going to cost in the future. So I think that at this point I wouldn't advocate for uh, restarting this right now unless there's a better way to do it, but at the same time, it's more than I want to spend. All right, thank you. All right, now it's time for final call. Public invited to be heard. Is there anybody from the public who'd like to speak at this time? All right, I'll close final call. Public invited to be heard. And now it's time for mayor and council comments. Are there any? Council Member Peck. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. Uh, I would like to invite the public to tomorrow night's uh, panel discussion on the future of fast tracks. It's going to be held at, in the Oak Room at the Tasty Weasel which is at uh, 1800 Pike Road in Longmont from 6 to 8 p.m. Thank you. Council Member Finley. Thank you, Mayor Coombs. I want to thank the Chamber and Bruce Partain for bringing up uh, construction defects. I thank them very much for their resolution. I'm in total support of it. I, uh, there are five bills left at the legislature dealing with construction defects out of the six or seven that were proposed. We can wait and see what happens or we can start to think about uh, doing something ourselves as other communities have. Um, uh, one of the uh, statistics I read was 3%, 3 of our new construction in Colorado are condominiums. In other states, in almost all other states, it's in the 20 percent, 27 percent, 25 to 27 percent area. Um, and if you think it's just because we're different, we're not any different. <laughs> we're, we've just got a bad law. So I uh, hope you all think about that a little bit because I'll probably bring it up again as well uh, as we see how these bills do in the legislature. Also want to thank Julia Pernak for coming and talking about uh, fast tracks. I know that sh she's passionate about that and, and we do need to keep on it. And I, Council Member Santos keeps calling for an audit. I do wish that uh, one of our uh, legislators would take him up on that and, and ask for that audit of RTD. When you see the kind of money that they're spending downtown, in downtown Denver, and some of the stupid stuff they spend it on, um, it really makes you wonder why we have to sit here and wait. So I want to thank her for that, and uh, let's be vigilant on both ends. Okay, well, I was out in Washington, D.C., and I got to ride on a uh, commuter diesel train, the Virginia Rail Express from D.C. out to Virginia, and it was a pretty nice experience. I mean, took you about six or seven miles out, and country where my son could drive down from his cabin and pick me up but yeah it's a nice I have to agree that riding on a rail is a lot sexier than riding on a bus. <laughs> Councilmember Bagley. Thank you Mayor Coombs. Uh, would there be interest 
uh, for my fellow council members to actually ask staff at some point to not, I mean, when you get a chance, nothing like right now, 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 to actually bring us back just a, a perusal of whether or not it would be economically viable to actually do commercial recycling. Yeah, sure. Because I'd, I'd like that. I mean, but I don't want you to, like, put on hold everything you're doing. I know you have a lot, but just put it on the agenda at some point and put it in the slot and and uh, just what would it cost to, to do it. We can look at that. Also, Bob mentioned that some of the, the commercial haulers now that provide services to businesses, I think, also provide that service, too. Western Disposal provide recycling to commercial? I think so. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'll call yeah. him. But yeah. I might call him. I don't. He just thought they did, so we can look into that too. Yeah. All right. Thanks. I know. Start the, with the simple, and then move to the. They do the cardboard boxes and stuff, and we pay extra for. Yeah, for that kind of okay. Stuff. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Santos. Thank you, Mayor Coons. Well, at the beginning of the agenda, we have that specific spot, so we're not doing this at this point. So hopefully that'll come up again so we can actually give direction. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate it. City, city manager, do you have any additional remarks? No comments, Mayor Council. City attorney, do you have any comments? No comments, Mayor. All right, this meeting is adjourned. At some point, I'm not going to be able to ignore you, Gabe. <laughs>